Hey, up. Right, we've all road tested a new motorcycle, a demonstrator, in the past, and we've made a purchasing decision based on that half hour ride or hour ride. And then later on, we've discovered the bike's not quite what we thought it was. Um, it may be better or it may not be as good. Because obviously, when you took that first test ride, uh, the bike was completely new to you. Just subtle differences with the steering, the foot position, the way it handles. Most of that test ride is taken up just getting used to the bike, so you don't really get a chance to work out what the bike is all about. Which is why you should never trust a first impressions review of a new motorcycle. You should certainly never base your purchasing decision on that because the YouTuber or whoever it is that's um, you know presenting that review is in exactly the same boat as you. At most, he's probably got the bike for a few hours, four hours, say. And then he or she presents an expert review on a bike that they barely know. Or, even worse, and I've been invited to launch events where I've seen this happen, they will often commit the whole review to camera, narrative and all, an hour before they even swing the leg over the bike for the first time. Because their entire channel is just a conveyor belt of bike reviews, it's just a numbers game, they're not interested in quality, it's all about quantity. And to that end, whenever I've done bike reviews, and I don't do many on this channel for that reason, I always insist on having the bike for a few days, usually a couple of weeks, or I buy the bike and I run it first and I get to know it before I review it. And true to form with the shotgun, just like some of the other bikes before it, my first impressions video was, in a way, misleading, because I, I, as I got used to the bike over a number of, of days, um, I realised that some of the first impressions that I got were wrong. So a series of videos, as I've done with nearly all the bikes that I've reviewed in the past, allows me to offer you the final review where I get the chance to set the record straight and that allows me to know that I've given you the best quality information possible about that bike. So in this video we're going to give you a full review of the bike and I'm going to give you some minor corrections to things that I said in the last video on Wednesday. Now, altogether, I've ridden the bike for five days, well, four and a half days, on a variety of roads, including A and B roads, motorway, and heavy traffic sort of commuting routes. And before I did that, I got used to the bike, as you saw me doing on Wednesday, where one or two things on the bike caught me out initially. You know, these reviews are not about me showing everybody that I can jump on any bike in the world and ride like a boss. I I'm just like everyone else. It takes a little bit of time to get used to the idiosyncrasies of a bike, to get thoroughly comfortable with it so that it's sort of like, or I'm sort of like, a second skin on the bike, and then I can go ahead and thoroughly digest everything I possibly can about it. And I'll tell you what, the Shotgun 650, the last review, you know, I'll let you know that it is a good bike, but it's far better than I first thought. In fact, and I don't say this lightly, as a general purpose do anything motorcycle, this is the best motorcycle Royal Enfield have built to date. First of all, let's just deal with some of those inaccuracies from my last video. We'll get those out of the way. I just want to discuss after that getting the bike up onto its centre stand because historically I get loads of questions about this with all bikes. And then I'll tell you how this bike performs on the various different road types and routes that I've already mentioned. First thing is um, oversteering and reach to the bars. I had problems with this in the first sort of half an hour of riding the bike. 
and then in both cases they disappeared. I think initially I'd been sitting about an inch too far back on the seat. I'm used to that big comfy sprung saddle on the mule. But then as time went on, I found sort of that, that natural position on the seat that after that I just went to automatically whenever I got on the bike. I didn't have to think about it. And once that change had taken place, I found that the reach to the bars felt perfectly normal. You know, it, it has you scratching your head as to why you had a problem in the first place. At no time after that, on full lock, at low speeds, did I ever encounter that feeling that I was overstretching either of my arms. Everything felt perfectly normal. And as I predicted in that first video, the, the tendency to oversteer, it was down to my riding habits. Again, I'm used to riding slow steering motorcycles with the Mule and the Classic 350. Even the Interceptor is a slower steering bike than this one is. And so with a little bit of time, muscle memory kicks in and you find that that tendency to oversteer disappears if i remember i had a similar issue with the hunter 350 when i first rode that and again it disappeared so as i said in that last video those were just observations made on my first ride so if you encounter it on a test ride of this bike or any other bike for that matter just bearing in mind it's probably not the bike it's you a motorcycle is a very different thing from, you know, test driving a car. With a car, you can alter the seat, you can alter its height, and you can alter its distance from the steering wheel and the pedals. In most cars these days, you can even adjust the steering wheel itself. You can't do that with a bike. You have to adjust your body to fit the bike. And those adjustments take time. Now, the other thing that I wanted to revisit is the tyres and the rear suspension. When I filmed that initial video, the roads were a little bit greasy. It was very cold. It was only three degrees. And I, I didn't feel like I could really push the bike to its limits on these windy roads. Now, the big problem with these roads is it's a rural area and most of the traffic that travels on them are either heavy goods vehicles going to and from farms or, you know, tractors, agricultural machinery. So these roads get really dug up. I know they look pretty smooth in this footage, but I use a slow shutter speed, which tends to blare the road surface. It's what you call motion blur. And I do that intentionally because a fast shutter speed, uh, it picks out all the detail on the road and it becomes distracting to the viewer. What I'm trying to point out is these roads are particularly bad. It's not so much potholes that are an issue, it's grooves cut out of the road by uh, agricultural machinery as the vehicles are bouncing up and down. And that will make any motorcycle squirm a little bit when the tyres run into those ruts. It also pushes rear suspension to its limits. Now, as you can see, I think you can see on the speedo of this bike, I'm pushing it up to the national limit most of the time, just dropping it down in order to uh, get round these myriad of sharp bends. On this ride, shot two days later where the roads were much drier and nowhere near as greasy and the temperatures were hovering around about six or seven degrees, I found I was really able to push the bike around these bends and handling is impeccable. The tyres behaved really well there is still a little bit of squirming here and there, especially on white lands, but that's normal. But at speed, the rear suspension really started to shine. You know, as I had more confidence in the bike and the tyres because of the road conditions, I felt that the bike has to be allowed to fall into corners. You can't fight it as you do when the road surface is wet. If you just allow the bike to fall into those bends naturally, it pays you back with exemplary handling. And when you're doing the urban cycle or the commuting cycle, which um, I'll show you later in the video, 
potholes etc are nowhere near the issue I thought they were going to be with the rear suspension it actually handles it pretty well don't get me wrong it's still quite stiff and on some roads you're gonna find it quite tiring but the rear suspension is better than I first thought it was now in the various days filming since that first videos um, I also got back an old skill that I haven't been able to use for a long time a lot of motorcycle manufacturers tend to make the rear brake quite weak so that it, it doesn't keep activating the ABS because obviously when you brake all the way it's transferred onto the front of the bike so the rear wheel if you brake hard has a tendency to skip and slide so over the last 15 or 20 years or so we've learned to depend mainly on the front brake because generally there just isn't enough muscle at the rear now just a quick dab on the rear brake of this bike holds it up really quickly in fact as I said in the last video there are times when you think it's better than the front brake in fact it possibly is what Royal Enfield have done here and it's exactly the same with the Super Meteor is they've redressed the balance with the brakes and they've done a fantastic job of it because no matter how hard I braked with that back brake as far as I'm aware the ABS never kicked in once and that means that you can ride this bike properly i.e. you can brake effectively without loosening your grip on the throttle it just tightens up the response times between braking and throttle and you know the old memories of how I was originally taught to ride by the police came back where you're depending mainly on your rear brake to haul the bike up only using the front brake when necessary which culminates in far better control of gear changes and throttle and makes the bike much more enjoyable to ride and in my opinion actually makes it a little bit safer instead of sort of dividing the attention with your right hand between your front brake and your throttle you can concentrate on your throttle and your gear changes just using your right foot to brake now just revisiting the clutch um, I said in the first video that, that there seemed to be some sort of lag what it is the rev bite point on the clutch is quite far out it's about 75% of the way out from your clutch being fully pulled into releasing it which was causing that sensation I was experiencing of there being some lag what it was basically I wasn't letting the clutch out far enough I do find this quite unusual on all the other bikes that I own the rev bike point is the opposite it's about 25% of the way out from the you know fully pulled in position on the clutch now it might just be that the clutch needs adjusting to fall in line with other bikes or it might be that Royal Enfield have done this intentionally I I'm not sure but because what it does mean is you can't let the clutch out very quickly you know you don't have to ease it out you can more or less just drop it and providing you coordinate that properly what it means is once again you know gear changes are more precise and the quicker which actually is the exact opposite of what you might think Royal Enfield have made a fantastic job of this bike now I always make a point of riding over the Humber Bridge on these tests because on the Humber Bridge it's always windy in fact quite often the 50 mile an hour speed limit is temporarily dropped to 30 because it's so windy and quite often high-sided vehicles are banned for fear of them blowing over whilst they're trying to traverse the bridge uh, now it wasn't that bad on this day but it was still very windy and I always do it just to test the stability of the bike with side winds because although this is a heavy bike it's got a low center of gravity and what that often means is the bike gets blown around a lot with side winds which can make it a little bit precarious to ride 
Now, so far, I've found that all Royal Enfield motorcycles handle themselves really well in these situations. You know, they're rock solid and stable. Don't get me wrong, you can feel the wind pushing you from the side, but it doesn't have that effect of tipping the bike over, um, as it does with a lot of bikes these days. The Shotgun 650 is no different from other Royal Enfields. Um, it just takes everything in its stride. This is a really stable bike. It's absolutely rock solid. And that stability doesn't end with side winds. On the motorway at 70 miles an hour, this bike is a dream. The shotgun gets up to motorway speeds with ease, a blink of an eye and you're there. The only limitations to holding it there are your concentration as a rider. Now this is the lead road onto the M62, I actually turn off just before it becomes officially the M62 to ride up over the walls. Now at motorway speeds, getting past slow vehicles is no issue whatsoever. As I say, the only limitations are your sort of degree of concentration as a rider constantly having to alter the throttle opening according to gradients and headwinds and there was quite a headwind on this day now i've already had one or two people question whether or not um you know you should fit a screen to this bike i don't know whether there is one available through royal enfield probably is but to be honest i'm not a great fan of windscreens on motorcycles for a start they can cause instability and they can also cause buffeting which is actually more tiring than just riding naked into the wind if you know what i mean now i know if you don't do a lot of fast riding on a naked motorcycle or you're used to a motorcycle with a proper screen quite often the strain on your neck can seem you know really bad it can be quite tedious I've always worked on the philosophy is that, you know, ride a bike naked in time, your neck muscles toughen up to that pressure on your helmet. And you soon get to the point where it, there's no effort involved. Uh, you know, it's not tiring riding into wind on a naked bike. What I will say about the shotgun is it's very similar to the Super Meteor. The aerodynamics of the bike sort of tend to push you upwards rather than backwards it's very clean air there's no turbulence and for this five or six mile stint certainly uh, I, I didn't notice anything untoward i'm quite happy that i would be able to ride this bike hour after hour on a motorway if i really had to i don't do it unless i really have to but this bike is a very capable motorway bike. Now, just for you guys in the States that tell me uh, average motor speed, motorway speeds are 80 miles an hour or 90 miles an hour, this 650cc engine will do that with ease. I think, um, anecdotally, the highest speed I've had this 650 engine being able to transport a bike, and that's a bog-standard engine, is around about 112 miles an hour. So... This bike will have no problems on any motorway in the world, apart from maybe some of the autobahns, I don't know. Either way, this will qualify this bike as a mile munching tourer. All suspension is working optimally at these speeds. Um, really comfortable ride, nothing bad to report. Now, normally what I do is I turn off at South Cave uh, from the motorway and go up over the walls which i did in this case but uh, in recent years they've lowered all the speed limits on that road it used to be an exhilarating road you know one of the perfect motorcycle roads lots of long sweeping bends um it's now all 40 miles an hour most of it is and it just doesn't test the bike in the way that it used to so that's why I did those sort of farm tracks earlier on in the video as a replacement for that because it's just not the same anymore. Mm -hmm. 
Right, hill climbing. Um, there aren't many hills where I live. It's all quite flat terrain. But we do have one big, long drag of a hill known as Market Wheaton Hill. It's not horrendously steep, but it's one of those long, power-sapping hills that's, I don't know, two or three miles in length. Used to be notorious back in the 40s, 50s and 60s for runaway vehicles, um, you know, old brake technology and all that. I just wanted to test how well the bike would get up it. Here we go, top gear. Now, I normally cut the camera audio off because all you get is wind noise, but I'll leave it to play for this one. There you go, no problem whatsoever. Uh, right, final test was just to see what it's like uh, on a commuter run through heavy traffic, but something that someone asked me, well I get this all the time to be honest, I've always had it on the channel, is about whether the bike is easy to get up onto its main stand. I've always avoided this question because I think quite often what it is, it's a lack of technique on the behalf of some people that, you know, it means that the struggle to get the bike up onto its main stand, the lack of confidence. Uh, I've even had one or two people tell me that they've dropped the bike trying to get it up onto its main stand and because the shotgun is quite a heavy bike, once again, I've had a lot of people inquiring about it, so we'll just go through that. Now, one of the reasons I've always um, avoided this subject is because, you know, I feel a little bit like it's just teaching people the obvious, but then I've watched one or two uh, YouTube reviews uh, in recent months where people are trying to pull the bike backwards to get it onto its main stand, when really what you should be doing is pulling it upwards. And this is just supposition on my part. I don't know whether that's um, one of the factors that comes into play with people struggling to get uh, the bikes onto the stand or not. Just pushing your foot down onto the main stand till it contacts the road surface and then push down with your foot and pull up with your hand. The shotgun maybe takes a little bit more effort than something like the classic 350, but it's not difficult to get up onto its stand at all. Right, so finally, what is she like on the uh, urban cycle? You know, that commute to work in heavy traffic, bad roads. Actually, the shotgun is nowhere near as bad as I expected it to be. For a start, it's a relatively slim bike, so if you're into lane splitting, that's no issue. 
The bike's well balanced and the clutch is light, so fatigue in your left hand uh, isn't a problem even over long periods of time in traffic jams. What did surprise me, because I, I thought it was going to be the exact opposite, was just how well the rear suspension coped, uh, especially going around the industrial estates where you know the roads are constantly being churned up by heavy goods vehicles, they're full of potholes. Don't get me wrong, you could feel them through the back end, but it was nowhere near as jarring and as uncomfortable as I'd expected it to be. All in all, this is a really well sorted, finely balanced bike. Royal Infield have made a fantastic job of it, and I honestly think this is the best bike, not just quality wise, but generally all round it's the best bike Royal Enfield have built to date and it gives any other brand whether that be Triumph or one of the Japanese manufacturers a run for its money if you're looking for a bike that can do anything you know commuting to work a spirited blast on the weekend some two-up touring with the option to do a bit of customization on the side this is the perfect bike and I have to say, I am sorely tempted to get one. The only thing that's holding me off at the moment is the prospects of a Classic 650, which we know is on the way. And as you know, although this bike is very tempting for me, modern classics are where my heart lies. Right, once again, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, watch this video and my other videos, and in doing so, helping to support this channel. I really do appreciate it. I'd also appreciate it if you would leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you're not already a subscriber. Your support is much appreciated. Now, you can support the channel in other ways, via my Patreon page or via the Super Thanks button down below. Either way, as I say, it's much appreciated. I am, of course, going to be back next week, so until then, please ride safely, and I'll see you soon.